Good afternoon, participants. Uh, welcome to the Intellectual Property Dispute Resolution Series. Uh, today, the 3rd September 20, we are having the second tutorial that is helping us uh, go through this IP series. We will commence with the words of the national anthem recited as we normally do. And uh, I will just take us through that. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. So uh, welcome once again, uh, participants, to this uh, series that we have been going on intellectual property dispute resolution. Uh, our tutor today is uh, uh, Agan, uh, Mr. William Agan, uh, an advocate and intellectual property consultant. He's a lecturer at the Catholic University of East Africa, Faculty of Law. His specialization is intellectual property. Uh, he's a registered uh, patent agent. He's also a certified professional mediator. Uh, he runs the firm Agan and Associates, lecturer in intell intellectual property at the Kenya School of Law, a former adjunct lecturer at the uh, Kenya School of Law, and a former dean school of law at the Kenya School of uh, Professional Staff. Uh, participants, like I said, today we are going through the second tutorial. The first tutorial, which was on the 27th of August, uh, 2020, to look at uh, patents, copyrights, related rights, and trademark. This afternoon, uh, during the second tutorial, we will focus on applications industrial design, new plant variety protection, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, and resources. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as, as, as the tutor was taking us through, we have been able to look at international registration and uh, components of unfair, uh, so we will see how this uh, uh, will be managed as we go along. Uh, one uh, welcome very much, and uh, Mr. Agan, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Agan. Sorry, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, was. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Mr. Agan. Uh, we are happy to have you uh, today to take us through the second uh, session, the second part of uh, this tutorial series, and uh, I will proceed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon once again, uh, participants. It's uh, always to be on this Zoom session uh, sharing one passion, and that is intellectual property. Uh, allow me to navigate around this as I share my screen in a moment. Uh, as we go along, uh, please feel free to use the chat for, for your questions and comments. Uh, Seed, Mr. Agan. Okay, thank you. Just going to today's module in a moment. <clears throat> um, just uh, uh, Mr. Gan, kindly. Yes. 
um, as, as, as you get ready, we will just have a, a from uh, Mohammed Said. Uh, Mohammed Said is a young mediator and uh, he will be able to give us a commentary uh, that just uh, gives way to your son. Uh, Mohammed Said, kindly. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you, Mohammed Said. Uh, let's proceed. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks for the uh, for inviting me to give a commentary and also let me again. Uh, the topic is a very wonderful topic and it is a very beneficial topic that uh, uh, it deals with one of the basic topics that uh, a mediator should know. Uh, the topic itself has uh, uh, has has been highlighted by by Sarah is. Uh, the intellectual property dispute resolution, if I'm not wrong. Now, if you look at the importance of this topic itself, it is uh, because it propels uh, the, it makes the economy develop, go ahead. Without uh, protection of intellectual property, there will be no, the, 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 there will be no protection. The, the, the aspect, the artist, and other stakeholders without such protection not be encouraged to continue with their with their development so it's very important that uh, the economy itself the intellectual property protected it encourage uh, cultural development and creativity so it's, it's a very important generally it's a very important topic because it deals with the basic foundation of the economy because uh, the economy depends on uh, depends on people's mind, depends on creativity, depends on uh, uh, coming up with new things and uh, signs. If about cars, all the in no new ideas and innovation. So without this innovation, and innovation cannot be to be, and uh, it has to be protected to property. So as uh, mediators, we did. Restore, we restore justice and the different stakeholders from the, in this field, if we understand it deeply, we will be able to restore justice and uh, make the stakeholders continue with the innovation that led to economy head. Uh, that's generally to my understanding, and I would like to benefit a lot from William again to understand the intellectual pocket and all the, the sides of because uh, uh, to me, as a mediator, by understanding it, I will be able to intervene, uh, try to mitigate and facilitate ends and resolutions among the in this part. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's my contribution. Uh, Hello, Sarah. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Mohammed Said. Uh, uh, commentary explaining what the importance of uh, intellectual property is and its uh, contribution to development. Uh, I now welcome William again. Uh, William is ready to take us through the main topics of uh, the tutorial and he begins with uh, geographical indications. Thank you much, uh, Sarah. Thank you so much, Mohammed you've actually summarized uh, the importance of this particular topic. We are in a knowledge economy, and you're very right when you say uh, in knowledge economy, the most important factor today is no longer human capital. Today, the most important factor is intellectual property, uh, assets that things bring to the workplace uh, or industry or even uh, in communities through and today we will be covering very interesting uh, modules that will touch all of those aspects uh, 
of course, we did go through industrial property uh, in previous sessions, uh, including copyright. And so just a reminder, we have uh, copyright and related rights as a class of intellectual property on its own, and we have industrial property. So we continue with industrial property, uh, which is a class on its own. And we will also be looking at uh, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions, which again is a class on its own because it be categorized uh, under either of the classes. But as we will be discussing, you will realize that it is also possible to leverage on the class of copyright and related and also industrial property. Uh, welcome. We will begin with a rather uh, interesting and least known uh, industrial property, and that is geographical indications. Uh, this is usually uh, as I. So if I continue referring to it as GI, uh, do know that I'm referring to graphical uh, indications. Now, what do we mean by DI? Uh, the in part this definition is to be seen in is to be seen beyond the sign or mark uh, that is used. The interesting part of this definition is to be seen in that quality of a product which the product possesses by virtue of the environment that that particular product originates from. In other words, quality or reputation of that product really be attributable to its geographical location. And geographical here uh, simply means location, the place, and specifically the specific place. So it's not. Uh, about a place like Kenya, but it is a specific place within Kenya, for example, or a specific place in India, a specific place within Mexico. So that's, that's really what differentiates, uh, to begin with, uh, a trademark from a geographic location. Of course, looking at the meaning, mistake it for trademark and in fact as we shall be uh, it is also possible to protect g by way of trademark but what's important here what participants i know my uh, colleagues that are preparing for the exam should take away is that the quality or the reputation of this particular product is connected to the place where the particular product comes from. Now, GIs may be used for a variety of products. Uh, the first two uh, products, agricultural and alcoholic beverages, have been traditionally acceptable 
and have been accepted for a very long time. Uh, specific manufacturing skills and tradition is an emerging area, is an emerging area and is now uh, gaining momentum. And that we are even discussing it here simply means that uh, it is the way to go. In a nutshell, GI consists following. The name of the place of origin of the goods, link a product to a particular region, indicate quality or attributes, as we have discussed, that is associated with geographic origin, and also suggest connection to regions inherent characteristics. Now, these can be soil, can be climate, can be the altitude, can be the latitude, can be so many things, the rainfall patterns or otherwise, uh, it, you know, when we talk of these characteristics, it may also imply, and this is really important, it may also imply production skills. Uh, and these are skills that, that the people, artisans, or the farmers, uh, are known for, you know, for. and it can also be processes that the specific, uh, people, specific resource uh, use to make sure that that particular product has those qualities that people I can say would die for, that people would die for. Now, we have in brackets also indicated, you know, soil, climate, and now, terrier here is a French term that includes so many things. And here it is a French term that is used to describe the environmental factor, a crop's phenotype, being unique in farming practices, and a crop's specific growth. In fact, this now uh, is a very heavily loaded term that describes what a GI, uh, a GI is. When T, it's more than just T, but it's because of the specific taste is attributable to Darjeeling in more example, tequila, for example, is attributable to Mexico. Uh, I think champagne, again, is attributable to uh, the village of Champagne in France. Uh, basmati, I think, is also another very common and very rice that we even here in Kenya, and I'm sure uh, in many other parts of the world. Now, look at all these examples. You'll realize that, yes, there are aspects we have covered of trademark. Uh, time, there is something beyond trademark, and that is 
you do not find these particular products anywhere else. Let me unpack it in this way. One, uh, I'm aware that we have perhaps participants from other regions. Now, this is an example I'll give from Kenya. Now, basmati is rice that we know grows here in Pakistan. And if we take, we are to take the seeds, uh, the basmati seeds, and plant them in Mue, then it will not be possible for us, but it will be possible for us to say that we have basmati. Because the basmati planted in Mue will not have the distinct quality it has from Pakistan or India. Uh, let me give a last example, champagne. Champagne is simply sparkling wine. But we cannot say that since we live in Limuru, is a, a place here in, 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 in Kenya where grapes uh, are grown. We cannot then say that we can use grapes from Limuru, uh, press those grapes and come up with wine called champagne. No, it's uh, possible. In fact, even if we were to go pick grapes from Champagne and bring them in Kenya and sparkling wine, that will not be Champagne. So really, that is one of the most interesting aspects about in the property. And that, and that it is directly connected with region, terroir, you know, uh, with the region, uh, I sometimes use a make sense. I usually say that conspires, you know, nature conspires to give us a beautiful uh, product that cannot be found anywhere else. We also do have African applications. And uh, perhaps some of you may guess which these ones are. Uh, and I do, I, I know that there's also a question that, uh, you know, uh, you have been asked to give examples of geographical indications from your own countries. Uh, let's see if these are familiar. We have black paper from Cameroon. Another one from Cameroon, Oku honey. In fact, this particular honey is unbelievable. Uh, the taste I am told, I haven't tasted it, but the taste is such that you'd, you'd think that it has been artificially blended uh, and the color is not as, is not red, it's whitish. And the taste has a, you know, of, of uh, cinnamon, you'd, you'd actually think that someone has blended this, but it is pure honey uh, that comes from Cameroon and that has a geographical indication protection. We have, uh, of course, uh, coffee, uh, Robusta coffee that uh, is very popular. And we also have so many other examples. Now remember, indicated that there is an emerging uh, trend because traditionally GI was directly connected with agricultural uh, products 
and alcoholic beverages. I'm sure that if you have one of these watches, then we would associate you in class or actually say that you have very good taste. Now, the skills that come with this that are made in Switzerland uh, are unparalleled. And we say that it's only in Switzerland that we have Swiss watches. And so that also today is really an emerging trend. And I can give many other examples uh, without appearing that I'm biased. Uh, towards certain vehicles, but I'm sure that the world has uh, appreciated that there are vehicles that come from certain countries that have something about that could be, could be Swiss associated with the skills uh, and tradition uh, that can only be found in those when we talk of, for example, just an example, when we talk of a German car, when we talk of a truck, you know, uh, we then say that, yeah, probably it can only come from Germany, you know, probably uh, it comes from Sweden and so many other examples uh, that uh, we exhaust in this session. So what are the key functions of AI? There are three key functions of AI. It is, of course, uh, as a product differentiator in the, same way, in the same way as a trademark. However, this goes on just association to a particular uh, uh, a particular trader or a particular company. This is a product differentiator that differentiates products of one region from one. It contributes to development in rural areas. This is a subject that we still be discussing in detail when we look at knowledge. Uh, later on uh, in the second part of this session. But generally, what we can say here is that GI is associated with a community. It is associated with a place such that all, let's say, for example, if it is a, an agricultural product, then we'll say that with an agricultural product, coming from a specific place, the rural community would generally then develop because the product comes from, and these products, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are usually not cheap because of that additional value. So that money, that then goes down to the rural areas. Definitely, unless something is very, very wrong, would automatically uh, develop such rural for a very, very long time as uh, uh, seen in the duration of protection. So yes, this entitlement to use uh, is uh, also by the, the, the rural community, value add, uh, promotion of the region and also economic, uh, uh, economic reasons. It is also a means to preserve traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. It's a means to preserve traditional knowledge, which really is indigenous or traditional intellectual input, come 
a particular uh, rural community uh, when there is AI associated with product that comes from that community, uh, then it's such traditional knowledge. Uh, and of course, uh, folklore and uh, cultural expressions that are seen on the outside uh, that come from the community. Now, there are international conventions and treaties that have covered aspects of ge geographical indications and have used different terms. For example, the Paris Convention of 1883 uh, uses the words in terms of source and appellations of origin indications of source and of origin. Please note uh, that we shall be revisiting those, those particular terms because they are very important. We also have uh, the, the Madrid uh, agreement and protocol. 1891 and 19. Uh, and this is really uh, a registration uh, protocol. Then we also have the Lisbon Agreement of 1958. And the one of the most recent agreements, and that is the uh, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, uh, the WTO uh, agreement, is one of, in fact, which is the agreement that uses the term uh, geographical indication, Article 22, and gives us the meaning or the definition that uh, to uh, on uh, in this session. Now, there are three, there is GI as seen under TRIPS. There is, there is appellation of origin and there is indications of now, simply put, GI then is a very wide term, which uh, restricts itself the geographical. However, appellations of origin narrow to very specific uh, criteria. For example, relations of origin over and above attributing a particular product to a certain Now go into establishing the connection between the quality or the characteristic of that particular product and its environment. So it's not enough for us to say that this product particular region. No. We now look into the appellation of origin, looking for that link that links that quality that we are talking about under GI generally to the particular environment 
and we had indicated earlier uh, could be soil, could be weather, uh, you know, including rainfall pattern, latitude, latitude, all those geographical uh, terms that, that that we know of, and human factors that go into production of that particular product, that product. An example that even he believe is the same example, the module is the Roquefort cheese. Now this particular cheese, I haven't made it myself, but to lovers of cheese, it comes with a distinct taste. How does it get that distinct taste? One, it is made from milk from indigenous sheep. Underline indigenous, meaning that is not uh, is, 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 is not can we say thoroughbred is hybrid is indigenous sheep. Number two, fed according to the traditions of the people that come from that area. Okay? Number three, during the passing of this cheese, the cheese is aged in caves, and those caves also have certain characteristics. So they are not just any caves. They are those caves from that particular area. And lastly, who else but the farmers that have the traditional know-how in doing all this that ultimately brings out the unique the uniqueness the uniqueness in taste and i believe even the uniqueness in the manner in which it looks etc so appellations of origin therefore brings out very stringent criteria Before we go to the protection, I had also indicated that there is this other term, and that is indications of source. Okay? Indications of source. If you can remember, indications of origin, indications of source. Now, indications of source is really nothing complicated. It means a product must bear the place or the name of the place generally comes from. If the products that you have right now, you'll find that those products are made somewhere. Okay? Uh, in China, I have stuff that are made in China here, uh, including this HP laptop that I'm using, uh, made in India, made in India, made in Tanzania. So, indication source a requirement product bears the name of the place where it has been made, made from. Now, how then do we protect? What is the duration of protection? There are several ways in which GIs can be protected. One is by way of sui generis system. And this sui system 
usually is a system that brings out the peculiar hands of a country. Sui generis uh, simply means its own kind, a Latin word that simply means its own kind. This term has been used and Article 27, uh, which really has given birth to so many various laws and member countries that are to the TRIPS agreement. So what is the dictionary definition? Sui generis is a form of legal protection that exists outside legal, legal protections. That is something that is unique or different. Uh, allow me to explain this a little further. There are certain laws that member states have been allowed to legislate because conventions and treaties cannot fully uh, provide for those situations. Countries that have come up with their own laws of protection, geographical influence from their own territories, including regions. If you can remember, last time we indicated that one of the regions that we in Africa is the African uh, Intellectual Property Organization, which has a sui generis for protection of GIs. EU also has, uh, and so are the other countries, the Federation, and uh, most of the Andean community countries and Thailand. Will in Kenya, you realize that Kenya is missing. We've had a GI bill, uh, seems to be dust, and as such, we don't have a law yet, but we have something that is in the making, we hope. <clears throat> the other mode of protection is by way of trademark law. When we discussed trademark last in the, in the last session, we indicated that there are collective or certifications. Now, looking at the peculiarities of GI, we find that it is very possible because it is not a personal uh, intellectual property. It is an, an intellectual property that various producers uh, as such, if they come as an creation, then they can be given a collective mark for their geographical indication. At the same time, they can also uh, protect G certification marks. Remember, certification marks uh, are those marks that send a message to the consumer that the product has certain qualities. So that is another route uh, that can be used for protecting uh, GIs. In case you have a GI law, we protect GIs or we say that we protect GIs but we can protect our products in a collective or education marks trademark law. And we have other laws, <clears throat> laws on repression of competition, for example, 
or consumer protection laws and laws on labeling of products. Uh, what we are saying here generally is that it's very easy for a trader, and this happens all the time, to on the back of a genuine GI come up with products that are not genuine, label as GI, thus misleading the consumer and making it impossible for the genuine owner to products because the consumer will just go by the label that they see. These other laws can also be used for protection, but it should be noted here that these laws do not create an individual property right. That is, they are not laws that are used for the purpose of registration. Okay, now there are four routes of protection. One is by protection directly in the consent. Industrial property, GI, is territorial and a when you need to protect it, you can then protect it using the laws of a particular jurisdiction, a particular country. The route in use is uh, by way of the Lisbon Agreement. Now, this is administered by WIPO. Uh, however, in order to benefit from uh, system of registration, a country must first of all have a GI law. So if a country does not have a GI law, then it is actually impossible to benefit from this, uh, this agreement. The third route is through the Madrid system for international registration of MAP. Uh, you remember that we uh, discussed this when we were looking at registration of trademarks by single file. And we have just indicated that GI is protected by way of trademarks. And so there's nothing preventing one from registering uh, through the Madrid system. And lastly, by concluding bilateral agreements between state parties or commercial partners. So this would be uh, agreements or specific terms that each party, whether state or individual companies, uh, would adhere to uh, the commercial world. Duration of, or term of protection. Uh, I noticed, and please is important, I noticed that there is no duration uh, of protection that has been indicated uh, in the literature uh, under this particular module, but I can explain uh, why uh, so, because it is very open. Uh, and this is because one, GI is with a particular community particular community and given that it is linked with a particular community one would hardly foresee uh, stopping the production of that particular unless the community is in place. What are we saying here? And this is also important 
discussion in traditional rights protection. A community usually is there to stay, and we usually say that it is there forever. And as such, several sui generis laws then have really not indicated a specific period of validity, which then means that, yes, your guess is right. Uh, it can be protected uh, forever. It can be protected forever. Two, geographical indications that are registered as collective certification marks are generally protected for a renewable 10 year period. Now, understand this in context. The duration of a trademark generally is 10 years minimum. However, one can renew trademark. So what I'm saying, or what is the conclusion here? The conclusion here is why this is a very important industrial property for protecting traditional knowledge and for protecting communities and for bringing development, as we have just indicated, in communities is that this is industrial property that one owns in perpetuity owns in perpetuity and i know that this can and continue but it is very exciting when you think about it okay uh we then go industrial design now Industrial design, again, uh, so that we are very sure, is all industrial, just like GI, just like trademark, patent, trade secrets, these under uh, industrial property. And it is actually, we see, on the outside. It is what we see on the outside whenever we look at a particular place. the aesthetic or the ornamental of a product. It can either be a three-dimensional feature or can also be two dimensional. It is composed of patterns, lines, and the combination of the symbols. So the visual features of shape, configuration, pattern, or ornament. is applied to a finished article that is either made by hand, tool, or machine is what brings out the industrial design of a particular product. And this is very, very important because it is what we, it is what attracts to the particular product, and we shall look at some of the advantages of protecting uh, industrial design. So, ability of an industrial design two conditions and Article Twenty Five uh, of Trips. One, it must be original important ladies and gentlemen it is very important for us to know 
the threshold, the various thresholds for various uh, uh, modes for, for the registration of intellectual property. So when we talk industrial design, we talk of originality and we talk of when we talk of trademarks, we talk of distinctiveness. Okay. When we when we of patents, we talk of novelty, inventive, and industrial application. When we talk of copyright, we talk of originality in the expressed idea. Very important that these things are properly understood and mixed up. This particular one, in industrial design, what we look at is how original the design is. Novel be something that has not been seen before, new. Naturally, design protection is territorial. That is to say, national laws are put in place to protect industrial design. There are some national laws that combine uh, several uh, industrial design in and there are countries, separate national laws for different uh, types of industrial. In Kenya, uh, combined under one that is the Industrial Act. We've combined sorry, we've combined uh, patents, uh, utility models, and uh, industrial designs in one uh, in one law. But there are some countries that have laws. industrial property and other intellectual. The other uh, mode of protection can also be under the Hague Agreement concerning the international deposit of industrial designs. And again, this is a uh, WIPO uh, administered treaty. So what are some of the examples of industrial design? There are so many, and I've realized that there are even more examples uh, in the modules, but I've thrown in perhaps some that are closer uh, to those of us that come from countries that value uh, uh, So you can see that here we have two designs, three designs. This one here is uh, get that. This one here is a, a two dimensional uh, design, quite interesting patterns with familiar uh, uh, patterns, uh, you know, uh, down here, zebra patterns. And, leopard or cheetah patterns and seven perhaps the big five uh, uh, right there then here we have you know one of those traditional uh, vessels that is again a 3d and here we also have a nice uh, table that is a 3d So what is the protection? Protecting an industrial design helps to a fair return on investment. Of course, uh, there is input, perhaps there is research involved. Uh, and as such, uh, an original designer, an owner would want to increase their sales so that uh, is 
a fair return on the investment, uh, not just on the but also on the product are brought uh, to the market. It also improves competitiveness uh, of a business against copying and imitating the design by competitors because should one or should one imitate, then they will have rights of the owner of the industrial design. And it helps to increase the commercial value of a company. Uh, a successful industrial designs constitute business assets. You know, people, uh, from the designs of its products. You know, uh, one would prefer one particular uh, design of a laptop maker of another simply because of the design. Simply because of the design. One would vehicle the other simply because of the design. Of course, you know, other, other factors like functionality. But remember, as we had indicated earlier, it is what we see outside, and that is what attracts people uh, the moment they see a product. Then it encourages creativity in the industrial and manufacturing uh, sectors as well, as in traditional arts and crafts. And this is really, if you can remember what uh, our colleague, Muhammad Said said, innovation, if you do not protect, if you do not protect the works of, a, of an innovator, then there will be no incentive at all. Uh, so if a creator knows, if a creative, if a creative knows that his work will be protected as long as it is original and new, then he will, one, be able to increase his innovation, but two, there'll be others that will also come in, even improve the design, uh, even uh, to great, same as traditional arts and, and crafts. Protection of industrial designs. Now, these are again in three ways. One, an industrial design can be registered and run through national laws as a registered as a design patent. And this depends on no laws. There are laws that grant registrations and there are laws that that, that grant this part. Now, depending on the national laws, uh, an industrial design can either go through substantive examination before the owner can be granted uh, registration of that particular design. But at the same time, there are many other countries, I know South Africa is one of them, which do not examine uh, applications. They just look at the formality requirements and grant uh, uh, registration to the applicants and wait for anyone out there in the market come and pause. So really, that's the between laws which provide for examination and those which do not provide for examination. Then there are unregistered in that lines. There are 
which is not a must for one to register uh, industrial design. And I'm sure that their own ways of uh, such designs. Now, the other here yeah, also interesting, and that is uh, in some countries, a design comes with an artistic ability uh, of the owner. There are laws also protect industrial design using and there are others that are lapping protection and they can combine uh, copyright laws and industrial in laws now when we when we look at this overlapping remember that each one of has different duration in our last session we did indicate that minimum protection uh, for copyright for example is 50 years of, <clears throat> of the author, okay? Industrial designs uh, have a minimum uh, duration of protection of 10 years, and we shall look at it in a moment. Now, when you think about it, you realize that when there is an overlapping protection, it is very possible for that design. And if this is your conclusion, then you're right, that that will have a longer duration of protection. We also have a WIPO registered, WIPO administered, I beg your pardon, uh, treaty, and that is the Hague Agreement concerning the International Deposit of Industrial Designs. Again, this one is uh, a procedure for an international registration uh, where instead of an applicant putting design specific national countries, one can do this by a single international deposit IPO. The design will then be protected in as many members of that treaty, uh, countries of the treaty as the applicant. Uh, wishes. So again, minimum, if you can remember, uh, the traditional, because of the uh, of the agreement, uh, the W and trade related intellectual aspects of uh, uh, trade intellectual uh, property aspects of uh, trade, sorry, uh, related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement, uh, which gives minimum protection, which gives minimum protection of the various uh, uh, intellectual property below which a member can would not be allowed. This is really just to bring uniformity. Again, you know, uh, touching on uh, prevention of unfair trade practices. So the minimum and Article 26, uh, three of trips, that which says that the duration of protection available shall amount to at least. 10 years. However, there are countries that have a higher protection uh, that 15 years uh, and 25 years uh, and countries that have a 15 years protection. However, it is important to note that the duration really of this is a cumulative duration. The duration of industrial design is five years, but can be renewed. Uh, thus, uh, totaling to a 15 years uh, protection. Okay, I 
know you rush, but just on this will this will be the last module that we'll be doing, and then we rush out to them. Now, new plant varieties protection. Uh, when we talk of varieties, we talk of legal protection that is given of that particular variety to a breeder in the form of plant breeders. And these plant breeders rights are intellectual property rights, which like industrial property, provide exclusive rights to a breeder of that particular variety uh, that has been registered. In the criteria satisfied when one applies for registration of PBR, plant breeders rights, is in addition to distinctness, uniformity, and stability. And this is something that we will be uh, discussing in a moment. But why they need to protect new plant varieties. Again, it is about getting the development uh, for the benefit of society. Various uh, it, it, when when societies uh, depend on plants for various things. that is whether for food or fruits or you know just uh, romantic reasons for example like flowers uh, things do not things are usually not static in any society Population, for example, does not be static. Uh, the end changes. And as such, but such factors do not are not static. Every other now, every now and then. New breeds of plants are developed to face such challenges uh, and to benefit society by way of making sure that there is enough, uh, for example, enough food uh, for it. The breeding of new varieties of plants requires total amounts of investment. In fact, it takes time to successfully uh, breed a plant. It can take up to 15 years to breed a plant variety. And so you can, and, and, and of course, you know, uh, time, uh, you know, money, labor, skill, uh, human resources, uh, human capital. And as such, it would be ridiculous that one, uh, after going through all this, uh, is not protected, is not protected. We also provide exclusive rights to breeders so that the exclusive right can be an incentive 
to breeders so that more and more plant varieties are bred for the purposes of earlier on indicated agriculture, horticulture, and uh, uh, forestry. Now, there is an independent intergovernmental organization, and this is the International for Varieties of Plants. This is based in Geneva, and it plays a very key role in among its members. One of the roles is to provide and develop legal, administrative, and technical basis for international cooperation and implementation among uh, members. It also assists different states and organizations in the development of laws uh, which can be effective uh, for this particular uh, plant variety system. It enhances public awareness of the PVP system. Then what the benefits of membership? Now, there are so many benefits that can be summarized as food security and sustainability due to plant breeding and on the our studies that have been conducted uh, in the European Union and Vietnam, uh, in the European Union and, and Vietnam, I think in Vietnam, price uh, have indicated in so many words, it was not of the consistent development. plants through there would either be insufficient food for both in Vietnam or you and Vietnam would require much more acreage much more acreage using the same food uh, food varieties developed years ago to sustain the population uh, in the region of the EU and the country of Vietnam. Uh, and I know the studies are, are, are immense and uh, I do not see the necessity of discussing uh, the study, but it is summarized as food safety and Ability, uh, due to plant breeding. So what is the threshold? As we had indicated earlier, the variety be new, meaning that it has before been commercially accepted. It must be distinct, and that is, it must be clearly distinguishable uh, from any other variety. And there must be uniformity. Uh, and here, uniformity, I've uh, been giving several examples, and I can give an example. In our country here, we breed up, for example, a lot of roses. And one you will that you will notice about the roses that come from various places, you know, in Russia, is that the roses if it is the color, the color is uniform. If it is the size of the bud, you realize that the size of the bud is uniform. Uh, so there is that un uniform of plant characteristics that one looks for in a particular plant. Then stability, of course, uh, the breeded plant 
remain unchanged in its relevant characteristics over a period of repeated uh, propagation. And then lastly, it must have a name. So a plant must, uh, that particular breed must be given uh, a name. All these, uh, if all these criteria is satisfied, then a breeder would be uh, uh, would be given uh, would be pro would be given by way of a registered uh, plant variety. Breeds now under the 1991 Act of the U. Convention, the following acts require prior authorization from the and these are now intellectual property rights of a breeder that has a registration of his particular breed. The exclusive right production or reproduction. Two is conditioning for of propagation. Again, you know, we are saying that yes, if there is someone who wants to do this, they just must seek authority of the owner. Three offering for sale uh, for for profit, hopefully, and for market exporting. Or and stocking for any of the above purposes. What we are saying here is we are not confining these to the breeder. All we are saying here is that since it is an intellectual property asset, anyone interested, anyone in uh, in, in, in exploiting a plant will need an authorization uh, from the breeder. And in any case, the breeder then uh, makes from of this particular right. Now, there are exceptions, however, and this, these exceptions are where uh, the person that takes the propagated plants uh, does not commercialize them. Two, if it is for experimental purposes, this is very common uh, among scientists, uh, where one just needs to conduct an experiment. And lastly, uh, when acts done for the purpose of breeding and exploiting other varieties. Of course, there is something that stands out here that is a common thread uh, with all intellectual property assets as long as there is no commercial purpose okay as long as you're not out there, uh, then uh, you will not have gone against the rights of the owner one would then ask what the remedy for infringement would be. And this is very interesting. The breeder can actually exercise his right to have material, okay, on the harvested material. What it simply means if there is propagation of products that are a subject 
of a registered plant variety that someone goes out there and plants and the owner gets the owner can be exercised right on the harvested material you can go to and uh, get an order uh, for the same uh, to be confiscated from uh, the person has gone ahead and uh, propagated without his authority. I was proud to get this from the WIPO website, that one of our own, and that is Consolata Mureide. Uh, and there's this variety, Strelit variety, that has been bred by Mary Consolata Mureide, whose application for PVP is under examination. Uh, Back to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gan, for being able to take us through those uh, three modules, uh, being able to look at the geographical indications for industrial design and the new plant uh, variables. Uh, we have uh, questions. We do have questions from uh, last uh, session, which were looking at the first uh, modules that uh, we looked at. And uh, also have uh, a few questions more. more. Uh, so perhaps I will uh, just pick that are uh, uh, more general. And uh, we'll have time to be able to look at the initial ones. So some of the more uh, general questions that uh, have come through eh, is uh, we have had med mediators coming in for this and trying to be able to understand the relevance of uh, this particular modules or this particular topics uh, for mediation and dispute resolution. Uh, so one of the questions is, what is the recommended dispute resolution mechanism for IP-related disputes? What is the recommended dispute resolution mechanism for IP-related disputes? Another question that another question that we have the opportunities available for mediators and arbitrators? Uh, what available for mediators arbitrators within uh, this particular area? The two are, are related. Mm. And then uh, the third uh, uh, question that uh, I will uh, offer is from the chat, just what you have touched about the plant varieties. Uh, is that uh, we, we often keep uh, potatoes in the store and keep replanting them. Uh, is there, an, uh, what does this uh, imply for that we mix them with newer varieties? Often put and maize in the store and we keep replying, uh, we keep replanting this particular uh, uh, plant. Uh, exactly uh, is, is the implication of mixing you know these old uh, potato and maize varieties with new varieties that are uh, perhaps coming you could take those three questions uh, mr gan okay thank you very much uh, relevant indeed starting from the first one uh, you'll realize that uh, i've always about uh, the manner in which a grieved party 
usually. An aggrieved party can have his rights enforced. Depending on the type or the classification of industrial property, usually the aggrieved party would seek for civil remedies. Civil remedies, in particular, in industrial property, that is trademarks, uh, patents, you know, GI, you know, uh, varieties. By now, you must have seen there is something common. The civil remedies that are available for uh, for aggrieved parties uh, in, in in such industrial property, and then we have the other class that is copyrights and the and its related or neighboring rights, which has two remedies. It has civil and criminal remedies. Now, to the mediators out there, as long as there are civil remedies available, or as long as there are aspects civil then it is possible to arbitrate or arbitration of course is you know recommended and as we know arbitration uh, can come in two ways one There is a contract between parties that has provided. And two, where arbitration has been referred by. So then uh, if, you're, if, if you're an arbitrator, then you will come in either because parties have for arbitration or because party agreed to arbitrate uh, in case of a dispute. When mediation, again, in the tiered system, say that there are certain arbitration clauses that also provide for other dispute resolution mechanisms, negotiation, and mediation as mandatory states and the arbitrate should negotiation mediation fail. So where there is such a clause, then uh, it would be recommended really for parties to uh, exploit uh, ADR. When it comes to criminal and uh, criminal, uh, the criminal acts are not mediated, and I think this one, uh, as mediators, uh, we know that. Now, appears also answered the second question, uh, which uh, is the is available to mediators that in any uh, this particular course is a course really very introductory, very basic, because it is important for a mediator to uh, know his subject matter that he is mediating, so that once you are through with this particular course, then you can apply uh, for empanelment at WIPO as mediators. The last question plant variety can be tackled in uh, many ways. It is important. Uh, it's just that I really, really restrict myself to uh, the syllabus, syllabus uh, uh, as provided by WIPO. 
But again, that when you look at our cultural practices in most third world countries, we had a culture, and we still do have a culture of storing our own seeds or borrowing seeds from the neighbors. For us, we say that it is good to share. Uh, and I believe the question asking for the implication, it's very possible for these breeds to then interbreed, uh, which genetically is not bad at all, uh, as we shall you know, be discussing. Uh, we look at genetic uh, resources. Uh, but again, we have uh, certain, uh, certain moves. Uh, those are under, under rights, farmers' rights, where, you know, a farmer now to continue, especially in our third world countries, to continue with the cultural uh, activities, know them best, uh, such that even if the, the varieties are mixed uh, due to cross-pollination and all that, uh, really not be considered an infringement on the so there are there are there are those those things that go beyond what by WIPO and come by way of maybe I can call it activism, uh, popularly known as farmers' rights, especially in third world countries. Farmers' rights uh, are also respected vis-a-vis -vis, uh, breeders' rights. I hope that I have answered those questions. Back to you, sir. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I, I have two uh, other questions that are related to, uh, you know, the work around uh, uh, IP uh, opportunities. Uh, one question, how is uh, uh, IP useful in engineering? How is IP useful in engineering? Uh, the second question that, I, that is related uh, asks, can IP help in my career growth? How can IP help in my career growth? This is probably from uh, Mediator. So you, the, the, the second one perhaps you have partly answered, but you can just probably add uh, a few more comments about that. And then next, I will uh, uh, give you some questions of the time. Yes, yeah, so just take those for now, uh, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, talk of engineering. Uh, we one one of the first uh, aspects of intellectual property that comes to mind is patenting. And uh, indicate that there's plenty of information, in fact, plenty of information on patents that have expired that one leverage in research in uh, and if one can then using that information, as we say uh, in this field, the wheel has already been invented. And as such, there is no use of inventing the wheel. So an engineer, you know, whichever, you know, whether electri uh, uh, electronic, electrical, or mechanical, uh, 
and who is interested in, in innovation would actually be the four-seater that we are talking about, person uh, having ordinary skills in the art, he will be able to really see whether there is an inventive step and himself can come up with an inventive step because he is by looking at what drawings are present, inspired, and as such, he does not he doesn't any authority of the or even if the patent uh, has not expired, can through this ways request the patent owner to look at the patent and perhaps uh, see where he can, you know, people uh, a product. On the other hand, if an engineer innovates, comes up with new, then he himself can also benefit and ground as a patent owner and as such can end processing agreement to, you know, commercialize uh, his innovation. Uh, so the first thing that comes is patent. But again, remember that it's not just patenting. There are machines that have a certain design, okay? Have a certain design. So the manner in which the machine operates would be protected by patenting. Looks that machine in itself is also uh, an intellectual in its own. And as such, in order for an innovator to be ahead, they then need that aesthetic or the ornamental part of that machine is good to look at so that it can sold out. He will have uh, an, uh, a competitive. So there are many other ways, uh, uh, but those are the ones that. Uh, uh, respond to for now. How can IP help in career career growth? Now, Sarah, you have mentioned that this is a I mean. Uh, then I could, uh, if, if the mediation point of view, then perhaps I have covered it in question on opportunities. But just looking at it generally uh, from the point of intellectual property. Uh, what I usually say, as long as I, as long as you're a as long as you're a human being alive, and I want to dare say, whether sane or otherwise, whether sane or otherwise, because we have seen that we also have special children that are extremely talented. So I dare, as long as you're a human being, you have a potential of having an intellectual asset. You just have to tap it. And there you are. You can then leverage on intellectual property and commercialize it like you have, you, like you can never imagine like you can never so the the career growth here is in fact it is unimaginable it is unimaginable you just have to identify or sometimes you may not be able to identify intellectual property lawyer can actually identify several intellectual property assets that you have or that an organization has uh, you know there are many times that we sit and do property of, of, of an organization and they are shocked and they say you mean property asset that we can leverage on that we can commercialize that we can 
people just don't know. So I quote uh, the, the, an assistant uh, registrar Kipi, uh, Miss Elvin, who says that intellectual is everything about us. You just have to open your eyes, the seat intellectual property. You know, the pen that you're using is intellectual property. The T, you know, it's it's all over. It's all the such. One just needs to tap it or look for someone like more or less like a talent uh, talent search. Uh, get an intellectual property lawyer that can just tell you, you know, you've you've got that, you've got that, and this is how you can uh, help your grow to unbelievable, unbelievable uh, proportions. Sarah. that uh, we do uh, quite a few questions from the first uh, part tutorial which we will be able to address later on uh, right we will be going for a break but before that uh, I might, uh, Wanga be able to make some comments uh, and we will be able to go for the break uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, as you go for the break you do not need to sign out uh, you can uh, remain uh, to the, the the call uh, because the break is just a very uh, wangari colleagues and uh, once again it's a uh, great to be sharing this afternoon session uh, with you we thank our facilitator, Ms. Dan, uh, who is an IP consultant and also at the law at Catholic in Africa for really uh, expanding our understanding of this particular topic. And as, uh, we, as we say that, uh, we are also aware that uh, that is uh, be taking an examination very soon um, in this field. So we hope that uh, these discussions have and continue to be very resourceful, not only just for your examination, but also for you to, to get into a practice we are referring to as um, intellectual property uh, resolution. What's been quite intriguing as um, we have uh, continued all this um, is as we continue to make inquiries with regard to the opportunities that are there for mediators to practice. World Intellectual Property Organization has the Abu uh, Mediation uh, Center, which actually focuses on the opportunity for uh, persons who are mediators, who are arbitrators, to uh, offer services in mediation, in action, um, uh, ex expedite arbitration, expedite uh, expert uh, determination. And we see this as uh, great opportunities uh, mediators and also uh, other uh, dispute uh, practitioners in other disputes have a greater understanding of this uh, particular work. Just to highlight to you, the World Intellectual Property Organization provides um, a number of clauses which can be used uh, uh, even when uh, organization contracts. And part of the efforts that we are undertaking at this particular time to um, ensure that we have mediators who have an understanding of intellectual property as we step out and we are speaking to organizations make sure that your contract uh, indicates that uh, mediation uh, comes first um, allow me to read uh, from the uh, WIPO uh, website which is uh, wipo.int uh, some examples of the clauses which are um, actually available and for organizations and this could be even uh, whether they are startups whether they are multi corporations so they, they just copy paste them um, existing co um, or uh, future contracts so we have um, a clause one of the clauses which is um, article 3 of the uh, world intellectual property organization mediation rules and it's focused on uh, future disputes so it says that um, any dispute, controversy, or claim arising under, out of, or relating to this contract, and any subsequent amendments of this contract, including limitation, its formation, validity, binding effect, interpretation, performance, breach, or termination, non-contractual claims, 
shall be submitted to mediation in to, with the World Intellectual Property Organization mediation rules. The place of the mediation shall be, so you specify the place, and the language to be used in the mediation shall be specified the language. If there is an existing um, dispute, then there is the, the World Intellectual Property Organization mediation submission agreement, and it says this is a request for a, world, uh, a WIPO uh, mediation, and it's also Article 3, World Intellectual Property Organization mediation rules. So we, the undersigned parties, hereby agree to submit to mediation in accordance with the World Intellectual Property Organization mediation rules, the following dispute. So you give a brief of the dispute, the place of the mediation shall be this place, and the language will be this particular language. In addition, in the event that there is um, absence of a mediation, then there is also, um, uh, an, I also do what is now ref are referred to as a unilateral request for, uh, for uh, World Intellectual Property Organization mediation. So we, we see this as an, an area that is un not yet been harvested here in Kenya. And we hope that as we continue to have more of the professional mediators with uh, understanding of this field of work, then that we can be able to feed the nation of Kenya and also um, the region with persons who can be able to um, assist to be able to serve disputes. So with that colleagues, I'm looking forward to our continuation of the discussion. We thank the American Spaces and the American Kona Nairobi for uh, enabling us to expand the discussions that we have to other persons uh, who are not necessarily uh, with it uh, community because our intention is that we can be able to have more and more people have a greater understanding of mediation as an option even as we do understand uh, area uh, being able to serve so thank you very much colleagues mediator sarah Ter, thank you for facilitation and mediator sarah Ter. Sarah, would you like us to speak now? Okay, colleague, let's uh, take uh, two minutes. It is three minutes past four. We'll be back at five minutes past four. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, come, uh, participants. Uh, I hope you have had a, a good break, uh, stretched a little bit, had some water, and uh, now we're ready to uh, proceed with the last, uh, the last portion of, uh, of uh, our tutorial today. Okay, so, so far this uh, afternoon, uh, during the second tutorial, we have been able to look at uh, indications. Uh, we have been able to look at uh, industrial design. Uh, we have been able to look at new plant uh, variety uh, protection. And we have also been able to look Questions, particularly with respect to uh, 
the role of uh, dispute resolution in, in IP and opportunities uh, for those practicing uh, dispute resolution within the IP uh, sector. Uh, this uh, bit now, uh, we will be able to look at uh, traditional knowledge, uh, traditional cultural expression, and genetic uh, resources. After that, we will to have uh, some more. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, next week on the um, of uh, September 2020, uh, we will have part three of this uh, tutorial. Uh, part three of the tutorial, we will be able to look at action. We will be able to look at developmental issues around uh, IP. Uh, we will also have a recap uh, of all the modules uh, covered so far and uh, final questions. Uh, the tutorial uh, part three will also be running from PM next week, 10th September 2020. Um, so uh, welcome again, uh, Mr. Agan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Gunn. Uh, we're uh, ready to to what's there for us in TK, TC, and GR. You may. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, welcome to this last session uh, for the day. And this is on traditional non traditional cultural expressions, big resources. <clears throat> Before we begin with uh, the substantive items of this particular module, I want you to reflect for a moment uh, on the duration of protection for different intellectual property modes that we have asked. And in particular, those modes that have protection in perpetuity because this particular module is one that we can say is an emerging area. As you may have realized, it is not expressly indicated in agreement. However, what has propelled this particular area is meant to which is in article 27 3 now allows member states to come generic laws which can then be used for protecting their traditional their traditional expressions tk and TC is. Now, the reason why the amendment had to be done of the peculiar nature of this intellectual property sometimes referred to as in us in property. And one of those particular, uh, uh, one of those uh, rather interesting areas is that these this intellectual property, this indigenous intellectual property is owned communally. So when we look at property, we compare ourselves that there are two, uh, two ways of looking at property. Allow me to use 
there is one that really is the Western uh, perspective of property. It's very in nature. And there is the other perspective that is seen in communities that thrive uh, because of TK and TCE, which is communal in nature. If we reflect introduction, and if we can reflect on the modes of protection, in particular those maturity, be easier for us to appreciate this emerging uh, type of intellectual property. We will begin with traditional knowledge and allow me to really concentrate on this particular. Now, this is a knowledge originating from a local or traditional community. Uh, some authors prefer replacing traditional or indigenous. However, traditional, traditional is more acceptable because it includes indigenous. There are certain countries that differentiate from indigenous in that within the traditional community, there will, there will also be those perceived now indigenous uh, to mean authentic, authentic uh, or authentically indigenous. So it's knowledge, any knowledge originating from a local traditional, allow me to read it, this uh, definition, indigenous community. That is the result of intellectual activity. Now, this intellectual activity is what qualifies particular uh, the intellectual property. And insight in a traditional context, including know-how, and please be attentive here because some of these terms are related to industrial property that we have discussed. So including know-how, skills, practices and learning, where the knowledge is embodied in the traditional lifestyle of a community. Now again, uh, this is another area that is an area of difficulty when we the knowledge being embodied in the traditional lifestyle of a community. Uh, it really mean that most of the time is passed on from one generation orally and as such there's evidence of any publication uh, in most uh, communities. Mr. Agan, you got muted. Kindly unmute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and this is very rare. And we see some civilizations that need to codify their traditional knowledge. The Chinese, for example, managed to codify their traditional knowledge. The Indians must codify their knowledge uh, and passed on from one generation to another. If you look at know-how, skills, innovations, I'm sure that some bell and we have actually seen these terms 
in one of uh, types of industrial property. Some of these terms were linked to the law of patents. As such, this really then distinguishes traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions. And I belong to the school where the two are different. And I can see that WIPO also creates uh, traditional knowledge from traditional cultural expressions. Why am I saying this? It's because most of the time, there are authors use traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions interchangeably and correct because traditional knowledge would be more associated with if we were to refer to an industrial property to be more more associated <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it would be more associated with patenting patent because it's about innovations you see this it's about skills know-how it's about know-how now let us look at traditional cultural expressions <clears throat> here we say any forms whether tangible or intangible in which traditional culture this time we're looking at culture and knowledge are expressed appear or manifested now if you can remember in the discussion of copyright with of of ideas and as such to me belonging to the school the tc is are indeed different or not. I then equate, for lack of a better word, equate this to copyright. I equate this to copyright. That's the distinction. When we look at artwork, for example, cave painting, songs, dance, etc we refer to traditional cultural expressions. But when we look into the know-how into production of musical instruments that are used for music, the know-how into traditional tools for making then we are looking at traditional knowledge. When we go into the know-how of which medicines, plants, are medicinal plants, we are looking at traditional knowledge. So that then brings out the distinction and traditional knowledge. Then genetic resources. <clears throat> Now, traditional communities depend on the genetic resources, traditional knowledge or traditional cultural expressions. The raw materials that I in whatever form come from the biological diversity that surrounds these traditional communities. So what then are these genetics for our purposes? Allow me to read this. <clears throat> this is genetic actual or potential value, including elements of biological diversity in their natural setting and please underline natural setting, and modern or traditional cultivars and breeds used in agriculture, genetic stocks. 
and can provide input for research and the development of products in an increasingly broad range of technological and industrial sectors. Missions of genetic resources. The exercise of prior informed consent by the providers of genetic resources and the resulting arrangements made sharing of benefits from their youth development are very critical issues. Now, we look at communities that thrive on the resources around them. And when we look at propriety, proprietary rights that come with these communities, we look at a special proprietary right and a very common proprietary right that is common to most of these communities, that is, they own genetic resources, own traditional knowledge, they own traditional cultural expressions as a community. And this is understanding. And given that they do that, they are also responsible to make sure that they destroy the raw materials they thrive on. And this is seen from the manner in which they use resources. The knowledge of using resources, the knowledge of storing resources, of preserving these resources for future generation is something which is known among traditional communities have not interfered with. So when we talk again of TK and TCEs, the same cannot be complete without GR. Now, genetic resources, in, they belong to the community. Does not mean that the community cannot share resources with, can I say, outsiders. And outsiders here simply means those who do not come from that particular community where these genetic resources thrive. Now, there are conditions that have put in place academically and have also found their way in the Convention on Biological Diversity, and that is the CBD. <clears throat> and these are prior informed consent and access to the benefit that come access and sharing of the benefits that come from these genetic resources that are owned by these communities. Now, let me unpack this. Uh, we have bioprospectors, other communities and other countries <clears throat> that come bioprospecting resources from these communities. That bioprospect, we would say, come for discoveries or for experimentation, etc., etc., which really is not a problem. The reason why these two are important is something that is known as piracy. Similar to in copyright, piracy. 
Now, biopiracy is a situation where certain genetic process and traditional is taken from these communities and exploited elsewhere without benefits trickling back to these communities. And because of that, CBD and many legis legislations have to protect these resources placed the requirement that order to access these genetic which traditional communities or indigenous communities then it is important and it is not just important it is mandatory that there be an agreement and that agreement must indicate that the traditional communities were informed properly with misrepresentation on the act of the so-called outsiders, those genetic resources to that community. That is one. Number two, there is consent that is unconditional and un from that community. Now, this is where the problem begins in ending uh, this particular approach. And I felt that this must really be highlighted. The, we have just these resources don't come. The question then would be, who is to give this consent? Who is to give this consent? Now, it has been agreed in many places and many legislations that it is usually have their leaders and they've always had their leaders. Now, those leaders are to be the trustees of these resources that community own. So one way of is that whoever is seeking for consent from these communities must look for their elders, look for leaders. These leaders are not political appointees. They are not members of parliament. They are not uh, in the office of the administrators in talking of the chief and for a very good reason. We are talking about those elders that are known to be leaders of that community that do not have any political ties with the various governments and the various states. Why? Because they are the ones that have been entrusted with these, these resources. Now, the other perspective of looking at the concept of trusteeship is also amazing and it is important for you to understand it. If this can be understood, if both of them can be understood, then it will be easy to why certain things are done on a particular topic. Remember <clears throat> that resources in a traditional setting are owned communally and 
it is very easy to understand that there are elders sit as trustees for the benefit of the community. Now, there is another aspect where the individuals who would say that they own traditional knowledge. For example, if there is a medicine man, you would then ask, would this medicine not say that he owns that knowledge as an individual? Is yes. But he too owns that knowledge, I repeat, he too owns that knowledge as a trustee on the behalf of the community. And that is an area worth highlighting to understand that where outsiders approach an individual medicine man, that medicine has got no authority to enter a prior informed consent with outside parties until others are in a community. Even that which an individual owns, he owns in trust the whole community. Go to the second bullet, which again is worth uh, elaborating. Because of because piracy is a situation, because of biopiracy, biopiracy is a situation where really certain genetic resources through traditional knowledge, are hijacked and taken elsewhere. For example, it is very easy for a scientist to come from a very advanced tree, supporting bioprocess, and then into an arrangement with that in man. Individual medicine man can take him to the forest and point out a particular plant. Now, when a medicine man points out a particular plant a foreigner, that would not be by because by prospecting a, a wild goose chase, it would be a foreigner going out to the forest to actually pick roots and barks and all that goes to the lab uh, uh, looking for an active compound from that. That is by prospecting. But where he goes and gets a medicine man who points to him that this is Mwarubaini or Neem or this is, you know, Tumeric or whatever, that would not be by prospecting. And in fact, if he does not have PIC, prior informed of the community, and he goes and carries on a risk on that particular plant, he will be perceived to have biopirated because he has taken a genetic resource, he has taken traditional knowledge, he has taken a resource for traditional expressions without the power the community because had he taken the same in a transparent manner through PIC, then the second bullet would cause the PIC would also elaborate how the that come from that research will be shared with the community so that those proceeds trickle back to the community in one way or the other the community can then benefit from that uh, research or commercialization of that particular product that owes its origin uh, to traditional content. I have indicated that it is important to understand communal ownership and concept of trusteeship 
which then brings out the modes of protection, whether to go by way of defensive, because a defensive mode would be a mode that I should say traditional communities love vis-a-vis -vis positive protection, which traditional communities to be a very Western concept. So what are these modes? We shall look at the tumeric case in a moment. One is the sui generis laws. Yes. Now, sui generis, as I had indicated, comes from TRIPS Article 23B that then allows individual countries to come up with laws suitable to their own situations and their own conditions. In Kenya, we have a recent act, a 2015 uh, act, um, the traditional knowledge, uh, the protection of traditional knowledge and traditions act uh, uh, of 2015. And there are several countries that also have had various laws way before we did immediately after the amendment of of trips uh, panama is uh, we have philippines for example uh, we also have uh, countries like australia we also have countries like uh, india that have a sweet that have sui generis laws uh, that have protected their their, their various ks and tcs then, so sui generis laws can actually combine defensive protection, but bring out, seek to bring out more of the defensive protection. Then there are industrial property laws and copyright laws. Now, laws, as I had indicated earlier, seeks, uh, seek to protect, copyright laws seek to uh, traditional cultural expressions and positive protection. Uh, is it possible for tradition uh, for traditionalities to use these laws? Yes, it is it, it is possible. It is possible industrial property laws can they can 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 traditional communities use trademarks? Yes, they can use patents, use industrial designs, they can use all those. But ladies and gentlemen, the question would be what is the preference what is the preferred duration of protection most communities prefer that whichever mode that mode then give them perpetual protection and that is where the problem is in sectors but since we have understood where these communities are coming from, it would be easy for us why they are laws that give them perpetual protection because for them that is their way of life and they do not see why at one time they can now be told that their rights over certain properties uh, or their right of indigenous knowledge has expired or have it, uh, their rights have it, they cannot see that. So industrial property law, therefore, and this is why I said you reflect on those laws that have got protection equity would, for example, be trademark. Because after the expiry of 10 years, the same can be renewed in, and perhaps that would really work well for community secrets remember that again uh, is an industrial property that uh, protects uh, protects uh, the secret in perpetuity now why not copyright laws yes copyright laws would provide protection for a long time but again these copy laws given the talking about individual protection. The copyright laws, and again, 
given that if we were to positive protection, we would be very careful on who to give the trusteeship of this particular this particular uh, rights and the rights would still uh, have to be uh, understood that even if they have been given to individuals, the community will still expect the individuals to know city rights as community. So what then happens when that individual dies, when 50 years lapse, when 90 Perhaps when 100 years, would we then say that these rights are no longer belonging to the communities? Again, that is a problem and that is an issue for you. So copyright laws, yes, they can be used, but they would not meet the specific, uh, preferred choice of community, which is a protection in now principle of public domain when we discussed it and we said that whatever is in the public domain can not be taken as an individual and protected under positive protection is the most ways of protecting public domain Then there is also a combination of laws, okay? Meaning that the communities can combine laws which can give effect to perpetual, really, to perpetual, uh, to perpetual protection. Trade secrets is very close to the heart of traditional community because there are some secrets that were passed on, you know, to the next generation. And the next generation go through some rituals and swear and take an oath that it will with that particular ritual because it is important. And hopefully that then would be in perpetuity. Trade secrets would be you know, though an industrial property will a law that can be combined. Now, the Tumenic case uh, explains how the principle of public domain can help, data banks can help in protecting these, uh, these uh, uh, intellectual properties. The Tumenic case one touching on the tumeric, the tumeric, and this is a, the University of Mississippi to identify an active compound in the tumeric that could be used as an antibiotic and proceeded on to the US Patent Office and patented tumeric. But guess what? The Indians came gun blazing, said, look here. From what we know, the tumeric is, 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 is one that we have had in our history for thousands of years. And it is in our data bank as belonging to us. And as such, there is no way an individual university, University of Mississippi, can now purport to own it. And it is in that way that the Indians won this particular case. So this and many other cases uh, type uh, have pointed at the perpetual ownership of uh, traditional knowledge and traditional expressions. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have to of this.
this. Back to you, Sarah. Um, okay, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gan, for being able to take us through uh, this last bit, traditional knowledge, uh, traditional cultural expressions, and uh, the genetic uh, resource. Um, I, I will just highlight uh, uh, some of the questions, uh, probably two or three as we go to a close, um, that uh, touch on what has been covered before. Uh, so, so this basically uh, take us the first tutorial that we had. And uh, the first question is, uh, how can performance rights be enforced globally? How can performance rights be enforced globally? Another question, uh, Mr. Gan, is uh, who has the right? Uh, who has the right to a film drawn from a book? Who has the right? to a film drawn from a book. And uh, uh, the, the last question that uh, I will probably give you to, uh, to handle uh, is in uh, reference uh, to uh, our local situation and perhaps take it uh, in an African context. And the question is, what advantage uh, is Kenya with regards to IP? What advancement is Kenya with regards to IP. Uh, so Mr. Gan, you could kindly take those three questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. These are very good questions. Uh, the first question, uh, I think it is important to first of all understand that performance rights are related rights, meaning that they cannot exist on their own. They cannot exist on their own without copyright. And as such, initially and on the face of it, these rights then would be protected by territorial laws. However, WIPO administers the WIPO performers uh, rights treaty. Now, that does not necessarily mean that there is an enforcement globally. However, it is very possible because there are several conventions that have been signed, uh, ratified uh, by various countries, member states are left to protect works that come from other member states. So it is really a responsibility that is left to the member states to make sure that they the works of those individuals or organizations that come from other states. That this global enforcement really, uh, is a mirage. It is important, nevertheless, to make sure that that right, number one, can be protected in that particular country where one intends it to be protected, given that uh, uh, a, ter a territorial right. But again, because of the conventions, then it is left to the states. And that is what really, and very honestly, uh, 
conclude that that is where the nightmare begins. Um, that is where the nightmare begins because not all countries and not all states uh, are up to the mark that uh, in that enforced nightmare, even in some of those advanced countries. However, it does not take away the right of the performer. Now, a uh, from a book would be and a discussion, the bundle of copyright owner includes adaptation. And if a book copyright, then now that book has exclusive rights to adaptation. Meaning that should one want to adapt, seek to adapt that book into a film, then again, it will for the applicant to enter into an arrangement with the author for a particular purpose. Otherwise, if he does not enter into an arrangement with the author, then unless it is a book uh, whose copyright has expired, problem. But if it is a, a book whose copyright is is yet to expire, then it is a must for the the, the person intending to uh, draw a book to get the authority. Advancement. Uh, that Kenya is making. Let me uh, say that as a state, Kenya has done much in this regard. Uh, and this can be seen in the number of conventions and agreements that Kenya is a signatory to. Of course, we also have a constitution that makes uh, international conventions and agreements automatically our laws. Uh, we have a parliament that passed and has passed the necessary law has placed the necessary authorities. We have copyright that has Kenya Copyright Board. We have the uh, 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 that has got uh, in place uh, Kenya Industrial Property Institute that also has a board. We have uh, KEFIS uh, that takes care of plant breeders' rights. We have board. Uh, we have other laws that we say are related to these laws uh, that put in place and put in place an obligation on the customs officials to make sure they impart, uh, imported that infringe or that are criminal in nature. Um, uh, if allowed into the country. We have progressive copyright law, for And so when it comes to law, to answer this question, the laws are in place. Parliament has done an, an excellent. If only we had enforcement, and this I say without any apology, we had enforcement of the same, then we would be in a better place. The that we have in this country, the nightmare that we have in this country, is that we lack enforcement. We lack enforcement. And we lack enforcement 
of several reasons. Uh, issues of and risk. Okay, we the police itself that the entire police force uh, that we have in this country, for example, uh, is uh, when you look at the ratio. Uh, remember the exact ratio that 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 that. that uh, that, that that is standard, but we are aware the ratio is skewed. The ratio of one policeman to to the to to, to, to the citizen is, is is skewed in a way that the enforcement officials manage. We have a porous border. We have a porous border. So when we talk of counterfeit in this country. It's so easy to point a finger at, again, I might be appearing to be, to be for the state, but the reality is we only say that there's too much counterfeit in this country, but the reality is that we have porous borders. Those porous borders are the borders that are used for bringing counterfeit. And of course, it is impossible for the, uh, state agencies to, to crack down on, on every other porous place. Then, of course, we have you know, the, the famous issue of making it very easy for, uh, for an infringer to walk away with, uh, with, with products that, uh, uh, that uh, are meant to be controlled. So in short, what I'm saying here, parliament has done a good job. We have a beautiful constitution that protects property in this country. We have regulations that have been passed in line with the constitution or amended the constitution. And as such, if enforcement could match the beautiful laws that we have in this country, then we would actually uh, be very, very advanced uh, in this area. Back to you, Sam. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Agan, uh, for those two. We have uh, other questions. Uh, we actually do have uh, quite a few questions, just uh, a few more that have come up. Uh, just now is a question about the, the Kyondo Sai Shuka and also the question of deal with the issue of uh, traditional knowledge. Uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Gan, these are some of the questions we're able to look at uh, when we have our third and final tutorial uh, next week. Um, afternoon uh, we have been able to look at geographical indications industrial design new plant uh, variety protection traditional knowledge traditional cultural expressions and genetic resources uh, next week on thursday the 10th of september 2020 uh, we shall be having the final tutorial in this uh, particular series uh, during this final tutorial uh, we will be able to look at uh, unfair competition, be able to look at developmental issues that are IP related. We will also be able to have a recap uh, that uh, starts from the very first uh, module of uh, time to be at, uh, questions spanning uh, through all the modules we have been able to go through. The session, uh, this final session will be held uh, in the afternoon between two o'clock and uh, four o'clock next week, uh, 10th September, 2020. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to uh, the end of our tutorial uh, this afternoon. Uh, our tutor has been um, again, taking us through uh, the different modules and I have been your mother, Sarah. Uh, we will uh, by being able to recite the words of uh, the national, the Kenyan national anthem in English, and then we will be able to close.
part of our nation, lest this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace, and liberty found within our borders. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Agan. And uh, we look forward to having you uh, during the third and final on the, on the 10th of September 2020 at 2 p.m. East African time.